Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's seminar. Uh, I am Amanda Khan, and on behalf of the Invertebrate Ecology Lab today, we'd like to welcome you all and our speaker to the Moss Landing Marine Lab seminar series. So first, a couple, uh, couple descriptions of how this online seminar will work. All audience participants will be muted throughout the seminar. Please do not attempt to turn on your video or share your screen during the talk. There will be opportunity for the audience to ask questions live at the end of the talk, just like a normal seminar. So once Dr. Pollock has finished his talk, you can use Zoom's raise hand feature to notify me uh, and Emily, our host, um, that you'd like to ask a question to Dr. Pollock. And the raise hand feature is located under the reactions icon at the bottom of your Zoom window. Also, uh, please keep your time after the seminar free as well. Dr. Pollock is available to stick around for a more informal happy hour and discussion following the seminar and question period. Thanks so much for that. And with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Joseph Pollock of the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. He obtained his bachelor's degree in biology at the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities, and then went on to do his PhD at Scripps. He did his postdoc at my alma mater, uh, University of Alberta, but he was in residence at Friday Harbor Laboratories and then did another postdoc at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. He then arrived at UNCW and has remained there ever since. And he's really a jack of all trades scientist. He's a field and experimental biologist, studies chemical ecology, benthic community ecology, and a lot of his research has centered on sponges, which is how I know of him, but he's also studied larval ecology and sandcastle worms, Phragmatopoma. Much of his research occurs via scuba, diving from boats, or from the Aquarius reef base. So in addition to uh, his research, uh, which he's got over 150 publications from him and his uh, lab members, he also uses that great diving experience to create outreach videos and narrates dives for the public. So it's a really neat YouTube channel. Um, so with that introduction, I will now turn it over to Dr. Pollock as he presents his talk, The Chemical Ecology of Sponges on Caribbean Reefs, From Metabolites to Ecosystems. Welcome, Joe. Thank you, Amanda, and thanks to, to Emily and Scott for helping with all of this and to you all for inviting me uh, to give this talk. Uh, I'm, I, I'm sorry that you all have spent the last year under these circumstances. Graduate school is supposed to be a wonderful experience and I'm sure you're trying the best you can, but um, my heart goes out to you all. And I would much rather be in front of you giving this presentation and traveling to California. I've never been to MLML and uh, have heard about it since I was an undergraduate. So um, uh, I, I wish that we were all under better circumstances, but uh, things as they are, uh, we have to proceed somehow and uh, here we go. So um, this, I, I love to give this seminar. And the reason is because it's, uh, because I've been really lucky in having a research program uh, over the course of the last three decades that just kept developing and getting more interesting with time. Most research projects, you know, sort of fall apart after a certain number of years, you just run out of questions and funding and that sort of thing. Uh, but this project, series of projects have just gotten more and more interesting as, as time has gone by. Um, so uh, uh, needless to say, uh, I didn't do any of this alone. I have a large number of collaborators to thank. Oops, why am I not? Sorry. Uh, I must have, there we go. Okay, uh, I have a lot of collaborators to thank, uh, quite a few uh, research collaborators, as well as a large number of students, both masters and PhD students, and um, uh, lots of funding and support as well. So uh, in no way should you think that I did any of this on my own. Uh, this is actually the product of a lot of people's work. Um, so today we're going to talk about chemical ecology, which is the study of secondary metabolites and ecological interactions. And you may ask yourself, what are secondary metabolites? And secondary metabolites 
are compounds that are not involved in primary metabolism. And another word or term for secondary metabolites are natural products. Um, human beings have been interested in secondary metabolites and natural products since, since ancient times when uh, people discovered that if you took a, a bar, the bark from a, a yellow or a white willow and uh, made a, a, you know, an extract of it, that that would relieve headaches and pains. And it wasn't until the 19th century that it was discovered what the secondary metabolite responsible for, for that medicinal effect actually was. And this turns out to be the basis for uh, aspirin and the Bayer Aspirin Company. So this is an example of a secondary metabolite. This is a compound that clearly is not involved in primary metabolism. Uh, and the question that chemical ecologists pose are, you know, why do organisms make these compounds? They clearly don't make them for us. Uh, so why do they make them at all? Because obviously uh, making these compounds requires some energy. So common uh, questions in chemical ecology are, are they using these compounds for defense? Are they important for, for uh, sexual reproduction? So for example, this moth responds to volatile secondary metabolites that are used as pheromones. Are they involved in mutualistic symbioses where uh, an organism controls uh, symbionts in, in their own bodies, for example? Or are they just present for no reason because their biochemical baggage is essentially a dead end? This is a perfectly legitimate uh, possibility as well. Well, in addition, chemical ecologists uh, frequently want to know uh, how the production of these secondary metabolites affects other life functions, things like metabolism, growth, and reproduction. So these are the kinds of questions chemical ecologists pose. And by and large, almost exclusively, studies in chemical ecology have been at the species level, meaning they're just really isolated to individual species and whatever species they're interacting with. So a very uh, 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 ecological level. So for example, this is probably one of the most famous terrestrial chemical ecology studies. This is a study of, of uh, the monarch butterfly that, that Brouwer did way back in the 50s and 60s. And you all may know this story. The larva of the monarch butterfly feeds on these milkweed plants and um, uh, is able to um, I, uh, retain cardinalide compounds in the larval body. And when it metamorphoses, it retains those compounds. And those compounds are a potent chemical defense. When the blue jay tries to eat the monarch butterfly, it vomits and quickly learns not to eat anything that looks like the monarch butterfly. And so the viceroy, which is the mimic, actually is protected as well, even though the viceroy doesn't eat milkweed plants. So this is a very famous example. But again, this is a species level investigation. I started as a graduate student at, at Scripps Institution of Oceanography in a chemical, uh, a natural products isolation marine chemistry lab. And um, I got interested in apply, using those techniques to investigate these kinds of species level investigations of chemical ecology for marine systems. And so uh, one of the, the first projects that I did looked at the chemical ecology of the Spanish dancer nudibranch, which it turns out derives a very complicated set of metabolites from the sponge that it eats. And then it has those metabolites in its dorsal surface and passes those metabolites onto its eggs. And this is the fish that we use, which is the blue jay equivalent for the purposes of figuring this out. So this was a, a fun project. It, uh, it very much parallels what most of the terrestrial chemical ecologists do. Uh, but clearly this is just one little species. And if you were to find more than a couple of these large nudibranchs anywhere in the world uh, in any, you know, several dives, you'd be very lucky. In other words, it's not very important at the higher level in ecology. Well, terrestrial chemical ecologists haven't done much better. Basically, in terrestrial chemical ecology, it's still pretty much species level interactions. There are very few examples where there are ecosystem level investigations, and that's because terrestrial plant herbivore interactions are really complicated. They're heterogeneous, and there are many abiotic factors that affect plant communities as you move across 
land. So, you know, if you go up into the mountains, you see a, a, a changing uh, community of, of plants that reflects the amount of rainfall, the humidity, the soil chemistry, all of those things are much more important than the consumptive effects of any potential herbivores. Moreover, terrestrial communities have been horribly disturbed by humans, and most of the real herbivores that probably affected many terrestrial uh, habitats ha were extirpated by humans thousands of years ago. Uh, and we've also added all sorts of new invasive species. So by and large, it's pretty hard to see uh, any sort of ecosystem level application of, of chemical ecology. And what I'm gonna to try to convince you today is that you actually can do that in Caribbean, in the Caribbean on four reefs, where when, when you look at Caribbean sponge spongivore interactions. And the reason for that is that this is a much simpler system. When you're below 10 meters or so on reefs throughout the Caribbean, there is much less of an effect of abiotic factors. Uh, the system has been considerably less disrupted by humans. Uh, at least up until very recently. And um, the species distributions are homogeneous over a surprisingly large area. In other words, if you go from one end of the Caribbean to another, you're gonna see the same sponge community with very few changes. Uh, and that's pretty amazing and it lends itself to some very interesting science. So um, I'm hoping to convince you of this by the end of this talk. So when, when I started working on this 30 years ago, the, the prevailing view was that, that uh, top-down effects on sponge communities were, were not there. That basically the, the kinds of, of, of fishes that might feed on sponges uh, essentially ate little bits of sponge from many, many different species and their combined impact was relatively minor. Okay, this work came from work that was done by these two famous scientists, Jack Randall, a very famous ichthyologist, Willard Hartman, a very famous sponge biologist. And in the 1960s, they spearfished thousands and thousands of reef fishes of many, many different species. They gutted them and they examined what was in their guts. And what they determined was that only a handful of species, mostly angelfish, were sponge eating fishes. And uh, when, when uh, uh, Willard Hartman determined what species were being eaten, he saw that there was a, a combination of several species represented. And between the two of them, they came to the conclusion that the net impact from such a few species over many different species of sponges was essentially minor and really didn't affect the community of sponges. Okay, you with me so far? So that was where they came up with this idea. Now I'm gonna put something in your head because I'll get back to this. In addition to them having determined that yes, angelfish were sponge eaters, but their effects are relatively minor. Annie Malin came along shortly thereafter and demonstrated that hawksbill turtles also ex nearly exclusively fed on sponges in the Caribbean, but everyone ignored hawksbill turtles because there were simply too few of them for anyone to take any notice. At that particular time, uh, hawksbills were very hard to find. I'll get back to that. Anyway, so we started our work in this system using the same techniques that I had used previously for individual species level studies uh, using this aquarium assay where we would collect sponges freshly from the reef, chop them up, extract them in organic solvent, uh, and, and then we would put that organic solvent back up into a food paste at exactly the same volumetric concentration that the extract was found in the tissue of the sponge. And so what you got to understand here is that we've essentially taken the chemistry of the sponge and put it into a gel. Then we extrude that gel into a calcium carb uh, chloride solution. And we wind up with this hardened spaghetti-like noodle that has food value for the fish, and it has exactly the same chemical constituents in it that came from the sponge. You can then chop that noodle up into little uh, pellets and feed them to our lab rat uh, species of fish, the bluehead wrasse. Blueheads are generalists. They eat primarily plankton and small crustaceans off the bottom, uh, but they're a particularly good species to use when you put them in lots and lots of aquaria, 
and you essentially do replicate assays. So the way we do these experiments is we give them these pellets and we count up the number of 10 replicate assays, uh, whether they rejected the pellet or not. And their rejections are very clear. If they don't like the taste of something, they vomit it up. And uh, uh, whereas if anything is palatable to them, they swallow it and go about their way. So we had this very quick assay that we could use to try to assess uh, chemical defense uh, from, from the secondary metabolites in the tissues of the sponges. We had a similar sort of assay we could perform in the field. It's more complicated, uh, but we did some of these as well, but I'm really gonna focus on the aquarium assay. So what do the data from these aquarium assays look like? Well, they look like this. So these are the mean number of pellets eaten in the aquarium assay. And in, for many species of sponges, the, these fish ate very few of the pellets that had been treated with the, the essentially chemical essence from the tissue of the sponge. But interestingly, for other species, they ate almost all of them. So this assay proved to be very useful because we could use it to isolate the actual chemical compounds from the tissue that were responsible for this effect. And over the course of many years and many master's student projects, uh, we came up with the chemical defenses of, uh, of most of the species that were chemically defended. And you can see some of the structures shown here uh, superimposed over pictures of the beautiful sponges that they come from. So uh, this was really fun and the chemists were very excited about it. In fact, we wound up uh, taking this further from the chemical standpoint. Uh, we figured out all of the mixtures of metabolites in the tissues of the sponges. And we even uh, took it uh, further in trying to determine the pharmacology of chemical defense. And you, I'm sure you're all familiar with the, the whole concept of how we perceive smells and tastes that it has to do with the shape, the size, and, and the functionality of molecules, uh, which affect how we perceive them. And uh, I, I hooked up with some fantastic German chemists who synthesized every possible permutation of this very famous uh, secondary metabolite from agalus species. And we were able to actually figure out what parts of the molecule are responsible for uh, the, the, the most important part of the response, what was just um, enhancing. Uh, and, and all of this was, you know, of course, really interesting for the chemists. Um, and it's always nice to be able to say that you know uh, what part of the molecule is actually responsible for the effect that you're seeing in the bioassay. But from the biological standpoint, a much more interesting thing stood out uh, to, to me and, and to my collaborators. And that was the uh, uh, amazing amount of, of um, uh, difference in uh, the relative response of our assay fish to the extracts from different species. Uh, so for some genera uh, within certain families of sponges, all of the sponges were chemically defended. But in other cases, there were uh, species that were completely undefended. And in some cases, those species were found on the reef. And what we clearly started to notice was that some of these species were actually quite common on the reef, even though they were palatable. They, they did not have a chemical defense. And we noticed that on some reefs where there were a lot of spongivorous fishes, that those same species were all nibbled down to little nubs on the substratum. And this is Cali spongia vaginalis, the gray tube sponge. It'll keep popping up in this talk. So we, we noticed that, that clearly these spongivorous fishes were really nailing these, these uh, gray tube sponges. And if you wanna see what this looks like in real life, these are uh, a combination of gray and French angels uh, taking apart a, a gray tube sponge on a reef off of Florida. And, you know, clearly they're concentrating their efforts on this one species. This is not what Randall and Hartman described. Now, when we went back with our chemical ecology da uh, data from this, this lab rat and looked at the gut content data from Randall and Hartman, what we discovered was, in fact, these sponge eating fishes are concentrating their predatory effect 
on chemically undefended sponge species. So here's that gray tomb sponge. It represents 27% of French angelfish diets and 21% of gray angelfish diets. It is a major component of the diet of these uh, uh, spongivorous fishes. So sponge chemical defenses are broadly effective against fishes and sponge eating fishes eat primarily the undefended sponge species. They have a preference hierarchy for species that don't have chemical defenses. And this became even more interesting when we started to put sponges out on the reef from places where these predators usually aren't found. And that's mangroves and cryptic locations under the rocks on the reef. And when we started putting these sponges out on the reef with, with paid, uh, paired uh, uh, individual sponges in cages and outside of cages, we quickly realized that there were some sponges that these uh, predat the sponge predatory fishes quickly consumed uh, as, as their favorites, essentially. Uh, and one great example here is the fire sponge. This is the sponge that causes dermatitis in people. It turns out to be a favorite of, of these angelfishes. They will completely destroy it. You can find this sponge in the interstices of the reef, but if it's ever found uh, out in the open, these fish will quickly consume it. So what we were discovering was that, in fact, Randall and Hartman uh, didn't have enough information to interpret this correctly. There are, in fact, three categories of sponges. The highly preferred species, which are found in places where the predators aren't found, or in protected locations in the interstices of the reef. There are palatable species, which are out on the reef and somehow manage to survive. And then there are the chemical defended species that the spongivorous fishes would prefer not to eat because they, they taste bad, okay? Well, an obvious question that came to us then was, how is it that these palatable species are able to survive on the reef uh, next to the chemically defended species? Now for this question, we took our cue from the terrestrial chemical ecologists. And uh, the terrestrial chemical ecologists uh, 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 are, and, and this is something you're probably all familiar, familiar with if you've ever been a gardener, uh, when you garden uh, and you plant seeds of, of palatable species like lettuce, you notice everything eats them, right? Uh, if not insects, the deer will come along and consume them. But if you can have right, growing right next to them a chemically defended plant like this foxglove and absolutely nothing will touch it. And that's because it's chemically defended. And what the terrestrial chemical ecologists have discovered is that in fact, palatable species devote more of their life function, their resources to growth and reproduction whereas chemically defended plants devote more energy to producing the secondary metabolites that protect them, so they defend themselves. So the question here is, do sponges do the same thing? Uh, is, are there palatable sponges that invest more in uh, aspects of growth and reproduction as opposed to the defended species that invest more in chemical defense. And this is a really interesting question to use sponges for because we have all these morphologically different sponges and we can manipulate them in different ways. So to test the concept of whether there were differences in healing, we looked at tube and vase shaped sponges and we simply punched holes in them and observed their uh, a healing capacity. Over 12 days, this Ursinia campana, a chemically defended species, there was virtually no healing going on with this sponge. But when you did the same thing to the gray tube sponge, the, the hole healed over in about 12 days. So uh, uh, there was a clear difference uh, with the unpalatable species, the chemically defended species, having extremely slow healing rates whereas all the palatable species healed very, very rapidly. We also looked at growth, and for these experiments, we used rope-shaped sponges that we could chop up into pieces. And we'd put these out on the reef inside and outside of cages, and we'd look at their relative growth uh, uh, over the course of about uh, a year uh, of duration. And, um, we ran these experiments over the course of 11 years with 32 different field experiments. And here's an example of some of the data that we got from one of those 
uh, experiments. Th these are uh, uh, rope-shaped sponges that are chemically undefended. And you see they have really rapid growth rates uh, inside of the cages, considerably slower outside because they're being grazed by spongivorous fishes. If you look at the chemically defended species, very little growth, whether they're inside or outside of the cages. So there was clearly uh, uh, faster growth rates among the palatable sponges than among the defended sponges. We also looked at reproduction, but here we had a bit of a problem because sponges are modular organisms. They can reproduce by fragmenting or they can reproduce by, uh, uh, by having sex and making propagules. The problem is that it's hard to compare them across species because they invest differently in growth and reproduction. And what we thought was, wouldn't it be cool if we could look at recruitment and colonization because that would pretty much integrate over both of those two things. The problem is that you really cannot clear large areas of space on the reef to then watch whether palatable species come in faster than chemically defended species. Now, fortunately for us, the city of Key Largo sunk a giant ship right off one of the reefs, which served as a location, a completely sponge-free location for recruitment on its surface. And we came along after four years and four months of this huge ship being sunk, and we did surveys on the surface of the, of the, the, the wreck. And our hypothesis was that the palatable species would recruit first. So if you look at the wreck surface versus the adjacent reef, which is about 800 meters away, you see sure enough, 96% of the sponges that recruited to the wreck were palatable or undefended species, whereas 85% of the sponges on the adjacent reef were the chemically defended sponges. So we got a really clear signal that there was a trade-off between uh, 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 this whole concept of overall recruitment and colonization and, and the, the production of chemical defenses. Now, an obvious question that comes after this, of course, is whether uh, there would be a succession over time. Uh, would there be a, a, uh, a tendency for unpalatable species to be outcompeted over time as predators congregate and start to feed on these, these sponges? And this, is, of course, is a, a very uh, important concept in ecology. The whole idea of primary con uh, succession comes from studies of volcanoes like Krakatoa. Uh, and sure enough, what we saw over time was a gradual replacement of the chemically uh, undefended or palatable species with uh, chemically defended species. And, and this shows you our most recent data from 2019. Uh, and we're definitely seeing uh, a convergence of the community towards what you see on the reef off uh, uh, the wreck. So um, this is a pretty clear indication that there are these resource trade-offs uh, among these sponges. So by about 10 years ago, we were confident enough in the work that we'd done uh, in, in all of these localized experiments to come up with a conceptual model of what we thought was going on on Caribbean reefs. And that was that fish eating fishes eat, eat sponge eating fishes, and they have a differential effect on uh, the different sponges depending on whether they're chemically defended, palatable or preferred. They completely eat the preferred species. Uh, they have to, they, they then eat the palatable sponges and there's this interaction between palatable and defended sponges that's based on this this resource trade-off between growth, reproduction, and defense. And we had enough of the species uh, that we had figured out their chemical defense categories to be able to say that this is what we thought was going on. Well, again, this was only the product of lots of, of uh, you know, localized experiments on reefs in the Bahamas and in Florida. Um, and it was pretty much um, you know, a conceptual model based on, on these manipulative experiments. We then wrote a proposal to NSF that got funded to test this in a much bigger uh, a spatial scale. And uh, the scale we chose was the whole Caribbean because uh, there is a hugely differential effect of fishing on reefs if you look across the Caribbean. Because there are locations like in Jamaica or in Martinique where uh, basically all the fish have been removed by fish traps. These, uh, these areas are completely extirpating their fish fauna 
uh, and eating all of the fish, basically. Uh, other areas are relatively well protected. Uh, you know, there are, there are places uh, like in the out islands of the Bahamas where uh, fish populations are relatively uh, robust. So we decided to survey uh, the two ends of, of the spectrum, places that were heavily overfished and those that are relatively uh, unfished, to test the hypothesis that the relative proportion of palatable versus, versus chemical defended sponges will change depending on uh, whether or not you've re removed the fishes, particularly the sponge eating fishes from the system. And what we did in all of these locations is we, we surveyed benthic cover and we surveyed the sponge eating fishes above the reef. And what we found was very uh, satisfying, very conclusive. Uh, in places where there were a lot of sponge eating angel and parrot fishes, so for example, uh, here in Curacao, you have extremely high uh, corrected spongivore totals. Uh, we saw almost exclusively chemically defended species of sponges. Whereas in places where uh, the sponges or where the fishes had been completely stripped of the reef uh, and the sponge of war totals were relatively low, uh, there was a much higher proportion of palatable sponge species present in the sponge community. And if you looked at this by comparing adjacent locations in the Caribbean uh, and, and uh, so this is um, marine protected areas versus fish trap sites. These are two uh, specific comparisons. 95% uh, uh, of the variants could be explained uh, by sponge of war abundance alone. In fact, we could get it down to the fact that we could say each angel fish reduces the proportion of palatable sponges by 8.6%. So a uh, very clear effect of spongivorous fishes on the sponge community, uh, very much unlike the, the whole concept that, that these animals are really not influencing the sponges at all. Well, you know, we had essentially shown that if you re replace uh, piscivorous fishes with people in this conceptual model, you can clearly see the impact of spongivorous fishes on the relative abundance of palatable and defended sponges. But what about the indirect effect of sponges on other organisms uh, in the benthic community? And uh, fortunately, we thought ahead to test the concept of indirect effects of sponges on reef building corals because uh, we essentially, uh, recorded that as well. We had already noticed that in locations where there were a lot of spongivorous fishes, one species in particular, the orange icing sponge, was always found uh, uh, in looking like this, essentially living around the coral, but never overgrowing the coral. Okay, and, and one of my graduate students who was working in Panama, where they completely overfished the spongivorous fishes, noticed that this same species overgrows and kills the coral in that location. So it became very clear that these spongivorous fish were nibbling this species of sponge down to the calcium carbonate that makes up the coral. So while we were doing this survey, we recorded all of the corals uh, and whether or not they had sponges growing adjacent to them and whether the sponges were overgrowing the coral themselves. And what we saw was that in the less fished area, this, there was much less uh, adjacency and much less overgrowth of sponges on the corals. Again, remember, it's the palatable species that grow the fastest, so this makes perfect sense. In the overfished uh, areas, uh, there was a lot more sponges adjacent to corals and a lot more overgrowth. So uh, did I say that backwards? Um, anyway, the overfished sites had a lot more sponges overgrowing the corals and there were a lot more sponges adjacent to the corals in these uh, overfished sites. So we could in fact see the indirect effect of uh, the, the sponge predators, which in this particular case is actually people overfishing the reefs. So uh, overall, if you combine both adjacency and overgrowth, uh, uh, there's, there's a two-fold difference between overfish sites and less fish sites. So overall, uh, we found a really clear top-down effect on the community level and, and across the Caribbean of sponges. Uh, uh, we, we saw an indirect effect of 
predator loss, including greater competition between palatable sponges and corals. And in fact, this is uh, actually a better justification for marine protected areas uh, protecting the, fi the fishes than the herbivory that goes on from those fishes on macroalgae. Uh, uh, we saw a much stronger impact of uh, MPAs on this particular impact on corals than even uh, herbivory. So, um, so uh, this was all very satisfying. Uh, and this basically brings us up to about five years ago uh, when we started to turn our attention to some of the other things that sponges do on the reef. And um, just to step back for a moment, of course, everyone is concerned about what's happening to coral reefs around the world. Uh, these, the circumstances associated with reefs are particularly dire, particularly in places where reefs formerly looked quite good. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing as you compare reefs around the tropics is that Indo-Pacific reefs, at least up until recently, are relatively more resilient, which means uh, even if they are bleached terribly by warm water events, they tend to recover relatively quickly. Uh, but uh, in the Caribbean, we used to have these lush coral reefs that pretty much uh, have not demonstrated that level of resilience. So uh, ever since they uh, were wiped out by disease, uh, what we've been left with in most of the Caribbean is lots of seaweeds. And this difference between the Caribbean and reefs in other parts of the tropics has really been uh, interesting to, to uh, our lab. And we wonder whether that has something to do with the high abundance of sponges on these reefs as well. And so um, uh, one of the things you have to understand first, and one of the things we were able to demonstrate or, or document in our cross Caribbean surveys is that the Caribbean has a lot of sponge uh, cover on it, 16% uh, across the entire Caribbean, whereas the Indo-Pacific has very little sponge cover. Uh, moreover, the morphology of the sponges on Caribbean reefs uh, consists of these very large morphologies, mounds, tubes, barrels, branches, lots of giant barrel sponges. Uh, uh, whereas on Indo-Pacific reefs, the sponges tend to be folios and encrusting, they, and they're much harder to find. And interestingly, the ones uh, in the Indo-Pacific include phototrophic sponges that rely almost entirely on photosynthetic symbionts. And you don't have any species like that in the Caribbean that, that's, that are almost entirely dependent on their photosymbionts. Uh, we have some in the Caribbean that have photosymbionts, but their reliance is nothing like the folio sponges of the Indo-Pacific. And this suggests that the Caribbean and, and Indo-Pacific reefs are very different in terms of, of how they're functioning regarding sponges. Well, sponges are really ecosystem engineers. They, more so than many other organisms that are called ecosystem engineers, and that's because they pump huge amounts of seawater. They can overturn the entire column of water above them every 2.3 to 18 days. And in so doing, they affect the chemistry of the sponge or of the seawater as they're essentially feeding on the material that's the particulate and dissolved material that's in the sponge. What they're feeding on is particulate organic carbon that consists of both living and dead particles, microbes and detritus, but they're also eating dissolved organic carbon. And that includes things like sugars, like the sugar in your coffee, but also refractory uh, DOC, like the brown color in your coffee, the tannins. So uh, their capacity to eat dissolved organic carbon could be hugely important in the ecology of Caribbean reefs. Now, our own studies on uh, sponge feeding using the giant barrel sponge as our target organism, uh, we, we found that in fact, while uh, a Zestospongia muta eats a lot of the living particulate organic carbon and the detritus, it also draws down a surprising amount of dissolved organic carbon from the water between the water passing in the sponge to the, to the water coming out through this osculum. So we can sample uh, right next to the wall of the sponge and right down the throat of the sponge. And what we've discovered is that 
Dissolved organic carbon makes up 70% of the overall diet of the sponge. Detritus, 20%, while live particulate organic carbon is only 10% of the sponge diet. And this is huge because generally people think of sponges as being particle feeders. And in fact, these sponges are mainly consuming dissolved organic carbon. Now, at the same time that we were working this out, uh, this Dutch group came up with uh, the concept of the sponge loop, and they did this using cryptic sponges in the interstices of the reef. And what they proposed was that macroalgae on the reef, seaweed, basically is producing a lot of photosynthate directly into the water, sugar directly into the water, and this is being taken up by cryptic sponges, which then spew uh, out shed cells that then uh, wind up being food for detritus feeders. And so in so doing, they take the dissolved carbon and turn it back into particulate carbon. Now, we've never been able to demonstrate this, this particulate part of the story, but we definitely confirmed that sponges are major dissolved organic carbon feeders. And adding to that, the fact that sponges are so abundant on Caribbean reefs that they turn over a lot of water, that they eat mostly DOC, you can add the fact that sponges excrete a lot of sponge pee, basically. They make ammonia and a nitrite and nitrate. They make a lot of fertilizer. So these are the nitrogenous wastes that any organism produces, and sponges produce them as well. So this resulted in our coming up with this hypothesis about why the Caribbean is different than the Indo-Pacific. And basically, because there are so many sponges and so much seaweed, the combination of the sponges and seaweed forms something of a feedback loop with the sponges peeing, providing the fertilizer that the seaweed needs to grow. And the seaweed makes sugar, which the sponges use to grow. And both of these organisms outcompete and generally make life miserable for the reef building corals. So this is, there are other aspects to this vicious circle hypothesis that I don't have time to go into, but these are the most, this is the most important component of this hypothesis, okay? In the Indo-Pacific, you basically have so little sponge cover uh, that, and seaweed cover is fairly low as well, that you really are not able to generate the vicious circle. So this is why uh, there are big differences between Caribbean reefs and oligotrophic Indo-Pacific reefs. Now the question is, why weren't Caribbean reefs always like the way they are now? Uh, why, you know, or, or moreover, you know, why is there this difference? Why are there so few sp uh, sponges on Indo-Pacific reefs, but so many on Caribbean reefs now? And to, to potentially answer that question, we have to go into paleoecology. And this is a relatively new set of ideas that are emerging. Uh, coming from paleoecologists who study the records that are in the libraries in Europe of what European explorers were encountering in the Caribbean as they were uh, discovering uh, these areas. And one of the things that the captains of these ships did is they kept really good records of important things like the things they could sell back in Europe and how to keep their crew alive during their exploits. And so they kept really good records of things like where they found turtles, where they found turtles nesting, and where they could find turtle eggs in order to use those eggs to feed their crews, ultimately green turtles to survive the voyage and get back to Europe, uh, but also because they could, you know, take hawksbill turtle uh, shells back and make combs out of them. These were valuable commodities and they kept track of where they found these things. And so the paleoecologists have used this information to estimate what the populations of turtles were like in the Caribbean uh, when the Europeans first got to the Caribbean. And on the basis of those calculations, McLennachan and, and colleagues have estimated that there were 11 million hawksbill turtles in the Caribbean uh, when uh, Europeans made it to the Caribbean. 
By 1974, there were 27,000. So that means that for every hawksbill turtle you find in the Caribbean now, there were 400 of them way back before Europeans extirpated them. Now, at the same time that they uh, uh, did this calculation, they also looked at the captain's records of what they were doing with hawksbill turtles. And back in the 1600s, no one ate hawksbill turtles because they tasted horrible and made people vomit. But by the 1970s, hawksbills were regularly used as food. And what we think the reason for that is because turtles, when there were 400 turtles for every one now, not only had they eaten all the chemically undefended sponges, they had to eat chemically defended species. And so back when there were lots of turtles, all of the chemically defended species were removed from the system. They were having to feed on chemically defended species and that's what made their meat taste bad. And so uh, uh, if you wanna break this down, very briefly, the history of Caribbean reefs goes something like this. Pre-Columbus, high coral cover, low seaweed and sponge cover, high abundances of turtles, fish, and urchin consumers, river input from pristine watersheds. Between the 1700s and the 1900s, overfishing of turtles and fishes. By the 1980s, uh, there was this terrible introduction of pathogens that began killing corals and urchins, which let the seaweeds uh, grow. Uh, sponges don't grow as fast as seaweeds do, but the vicious circle basically began at that point because you had lots of seaweeds producing sugars that enhanced the growth of sponges. Low abundance of seaweed and sponge consumers because we were overfishing the reefs. And by the present time, very low coral cover, high seaweed and growing sponge cover, and the vicious circle is well established with the seaweeds providing sugar for the sponges, the sponges providing fertilizer for the seaweeds, and basically the recovering consumers have a hard time keeping up with the abundance of seaweeds and sponges on Caribbean reefs. Now, just as we were getting all of this out, um, another paleoecological study came out from Lakoviak et al, where they did cores of reefs in Panama and looked at the glass spicules that are found in sponges. And sure enough, starting 400 years ago, the spicule, sponge spicule record shifts from palatable sponge species, or it's, it shifts from chemically defended to more palatable sponge species, in particular, geodia, which is a species that has a highly um, uh, recognizable sponge spicule type. And so in their cores, they could actually see this shift going on in the cores themselves. So this is a really uh, interesting sort of congruent set of data that indicates that our hypothesis about the, the vicious circle and the effects of overfishing of turtles as well as sponge, spongivorous fishes had a huge impact on the ecology of the Caribbean. So to sort of summarize this, pre-Columbian Caribbean reefs looked like this. Lots of hard coral cover, basically similar to Indo-Pacific reefs of, of the present because the sponge populations were driven down by spongivorous fishes that were eating not just the palatable species, but the chemically defended species as well. Why? They didn't have anything else to eat, right? By the time you reach contemporary Caribbean reefs, all the hawksbill turtles were extirpated. Um, you're left with low levels of spongivory. And so of course the sponges uh, are, are abundant as are the macroalgae and the vicious circle is well established. Now, this is a pretty sad story, but if there's one sort of sunny ray of hope, that is that the last, 50 years of turtle protection has resulted in surprising levels of hawksbill turtles on Caribbean reefs. It used to be that uh, uh, back in the 90s, we were lucky if we saw one hawksbill turtle on two weeks of diving. And now if you go into the Caribbean diving, you see hawksbills regularly. They're all small juveniles. And what are those hawksbills doing? They are attacking their favorite food. Uh, they are murdering Geodia uh, gibberosa and Neptuni on uh, Caribbean reefs. They're starting to eat those most palatable species that are present on the reef. So uh, maybe 
uh, as these populations of turtles increase, they'll uh, draw down the populations of palatable sponges and start working on the chemically defended sponges. And we may start to get this under control. Uh, I'm certainly not holding my breath, but uh, it is one bright spot in an otherwise relatively gloomy picture for Caribbean coral reefs. So I'm sorry that this has gone very rapidly, but I've basically taken you from chemical defense to community patterns of defense and, and how that affects overall ecosystem level view, trophic cascades, indirect effects and resource trade-offs. Uh, this leads us to ecosystem function, policy implications, marine protected areas, and ultimately to the biogeography of reefs, historical ecology, and carbon and nutrient cycling. So with that, uh, I would like to thank you all for your attention. I'm only over by a couple minutes, I see, and uh, I am happy to answer questions. I would invite you all to turn on your videos when you ask me questions so I can actually see your faces. And um, with that, I will stop sharing, I hope. And uh, great. And Let's see, am I supposed to let you all hear me? That was fantastic. Yeah, um, I can, uh, I'm happy to facilitate the questions as they come in. Just as okay. a reminder for everyone, um, you can use the raise hand feature under the reactions icon at the bottom of your Zoom window to raise your hands. Um, and uh, yeah, and I'll watch for that. Okay, great. In the meantime, that was fantastic. I, I really didn't know so much about the Caribbean and how it works. And there's so many interesting um, ideas and parallels and, and differences from how things work over here. So really basic question first is, I notice a lot of um, snails, different mollusks and nudibranchs that feed on sponges around here. Are right. there sort of meso or mid-level predators that prey on sponges in the Caribbean or is it mainly fish? It, it is mainly fish, Amanda. The the um, it's and it's interesting. In the Indo-Pacific, you have lots of sea stars on the reef. You have lots of different gastropods and nudibranchs eating sponges. Um, you're lucky if you can find a handful of nudibranchs in your entire dive career in the Caribbean. They are really hard to find. Um, and cowries. We do have cowries, but they have. They actually prefer chemically defended species and their impacts are very localized. They graze small amounts of tissue. They don't seem to do nearly the damage that these big turtles, you know, turtles damp, you know, eat completely the sponge off the reef. The, the large angelfishes do quite a bit of damage to the sponges when they decide they want to feed on them. So, so it's real interesting. There's there is mesograzer level uh, effects, but they are considerably less impactful than the fishes and turtles. And, you know, when Randall and Hartman wrote their treatise, they figured fishes were the only game in town because of course they didn't see any turtles. Uh, and, and, you know, so once you start seeing the turtles and how badly they can, you know, consume sponges, you really realize how different the system must have been when there were 400 of them for every one that you see now. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that was a, a really neat, stunning story, too. But um, I'm going to open up to uh, Bobby Dalmeyer. I see has um, his hand raised. So I'm going to ask you to unmute. Hey, uh, Dr. Pollock. I'm sorry, I don't have a camera on my large monitor. No um, worries. So no worries. <laughs> I wanted this on the big screen in my <laughs> home impromptu office. Um, but I thought this was a fabulous talk. Thank you so much for giving it. It was very interesting. It was really cool to see all this stuff over so many years. And I grew up in Florida. So like, you're kind of in my area there working there. So um, that was neat. And I'm also extremely jealous. Uh, I went to NC State. And um, so North Carolina is near and dear to my heart, but I'm really jealous that I'm not going to be there to witness Brood 10 coming of the cicadas this year. Because that's, well, you know, down here in Wilmington, we don't get them. I, I spent oh. uh, two years in Washington, D.C., and it's amazing. I mean, they cover, they, they're this thick on the ground in D.C. They're this oh thick. It's, it's just, I, 
never seen anything like it. So yeah, I, I would actually consider driving up there to see them again. And they're, they're really cool. They have bright red eyes. They're not like the normal cicadas that are just big and green. They have, they're brightly colored and, and yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, so uh, you have to go up to the Piedmont here though, to see them. So. Okay. Yeah, I know. I would, you know, I, re I remember seeing some in Raleigh before. I don't, not these giant broods, but I wish I could be there to see that. But um, I'm out here in California and said, um, I want to go back to your growth experiments that you did. I just, uh, in the cages, what struck me was the defended sponges, some of them have negative growth. Was right. that due to like fouling or something or what was going on there? So, so Amanda just asked the question about mesograzers. It turns out the cages attract cowries and the mm -hmm. chemically defended species are the ones that cowries eat. So the cowries would nibble on the sponges in the cages and actually reduce their growth. Whereas when, these are the, the cool little stories that never come out in the paper because, you know, I mean, I may have actually included that in the discussion. But um, when there wasn't a cage, the uh, spiny lobster will eat the cowries and drive them under the cages. So the cowries have a field day when they're in the, under the cages because they're totally protected from the spiny lobsters and they can eat the sponge. Isn't that interesting? Cool? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, that was a cool little story there. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Sure. It's an interesting story. <laughs> All right, looks like we have a question from Scott Hamilton. Um, Scott, you're unmuted. All right, video on. Hi, Scott. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, that was, uh, as Amanda said, I mean, such a, an amazing and comprehensive body of work. That was, that was really cool. Um, so I had a question about the, like the secondary metabolites that the defended sponges uh, produce. Uh, is that mainly, is it mainly only deter predators or is there any allelopathic effects on like when they interact with corals? You know, a lot of seaweeds that produce those, those types of metabolites have those allelopathic negative effects on corals. I was wondering if the defended sponges the same way as they compete with corals on the reef. Right, we have, uh, that's a whole nother talk, Scott. <laughs> um, we'll have to have you back we, we came up with a whole not only field but but um lab well a whole bunch of different kinds of assays to test for allelopathy and we did see it uh and there's an lno paper where we came up with this technique for putting gels that had the secondary metabolites over the surfaces of corals and then using pam fluorometry to measure the effects on the corals themselves mm -hmm. we also uh, uh, we, we looked at sponge-sponge interactions by putting sponges in the center of a tic-tac-toe diagram with gels from other sponges with the secondary metabolites, and then saw how they overgrew gels that had the secondary metabolites versus those that didn't. So we could measure, you know, whether they grew outward equally over controlled gels versus chemically defended gels, and we saw really clear effects. So yes, there definitely are potential allelopathic effects as well. But I think that the, the broader point that you're getting at is we really never know what, I mean, there, there's a huge mixture of secondary metabolites in these tissues. And we never really know what some of them are for or whether you need the whole mixture or whether it's just one or, you know, you could, you could really go down a rabbit hole with trying to understand all of it. And, and one of the things that annoys me to no end is that um, some people always figure that if there's a weird metabolite present somewhere, it must have a function. No, you know, it's, it, it might just be so much biochemical baggage. There's no natural selective force that, that guides every single compound that's present in the tissue of a sponge. Uh, it could be, you know, part of some other process or it could have been there. Maybe it's a chemical defense against trilobites and they're still making it all these years later. Yeah. So, you know, uh, uh, there, there are lots of possibilities. Um, so you can never really know. Thanks. Yeah. And I, I also enjoyed seeing all the work with the blue head rats. I did my PhD work on blue head rats. I was in Bob Warner's lab and spent oh, a lot of time sure. in Florida, So yeah, very familiar yeah. with them. It's a good lab rat. So. Oh, they're, they're <laughs> tremendous. They're tremendous. Yeah. yeah. And they, they have such a clear, a uh, uh, vomiting response. And it's, it's like, it's almost like a chemical reaction. You know, you put the pellet in there, bleh, they just spit it right out, you know, 
I, I had fleets of undergraduates scoring assays, you know, so it was a, a great system. Yeah, awesome. Thanks again. Sure. Very neat. Um, I actually just want to follow up super briefly. I see two more hands, but just to follow up on that, I had wanted to ask if you know if, if any of these defenses are inducible or if it's constant uh, that sponges would be producing it. So have you ever seen changes in the levels of deterrence or anything like that over time? Sure, or we looked at for all of those things. We could never find um, any sort of strangely uh, to an almost surprising degree, we could never find um, uh, inducible defenses. Uh, we could never find, um, we, we couldn't even find that there were, for a, a given species that had sort of variable defenses, we couldn't find that there was more, there were more defended individuals in areas where there was strong spongivory. We couldn't find that. Um, it was kind of, well, we, there was no effect, and and uh, which is really strange because you'd think that they that they would basically force that, but um, and it may have something to do with the fact that the spongivores are just overwhelmed by the abundance of sponges on the reef now, uh, and of course they prefer the the preferred species. So among the palatable and moderately, you know, there's a spectrum of defense among the the the. the species that are available. But but yeah, we, you know, there are all these sort of standard things that the plant insect people have, have demonstrated in terrestrial chemical ecology. And we sort of went after each one of those in turn, but we never saw the, the highly structured uh, kinds of, of stories that you see in plant uh, insect interactions. That's really interesting, yeah. yeah. Okay, we've got two more questions. Um, uh, so first one is from Alex. You should be able to unmute now, Alex. I am. Hi, uh, thanks again. Great talk, as everyone else has said. Um, I thought your section on historical ecology was kind of especially interesting. Um, I feel like if I was a researcher, it would never even occur to me to, to look at the logs that Columbus took or like any of these other really old documents. And, and I didn't do that. I'm just recording <laughs> other people's data. But yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. I guess I, it's my first time hearing about that kind of work. And I'm curious, you may not know, but I'm curious like what that kind of process is like if you work with specialists in these documents or how you access that kind of data or any of that kind of stuff. I, I can't really tell you. I'm just reporting what they reported. But evidently, you have to hang out in the British Museum a lot and uh, go through lots and lots of old books and get special permission to, you know, read through captain's logs. Um, you know, the thing about paleoecology is, um, uh, you know, obviously, it's it's they it makes for great stories and and you know they're only going by what they read, uh, but there's clearly some sort of signal there. It's not quantifiable to the degree that, you know, measuring organisms in the now and, and the present uh, is like, but, but uh, nevertheless, it's, uh, it, it's kind of a new area, that, at least it's been a new area for the last 10 years or so. And, uh, but I, uh, aside from uh, spending a lot of time in old libraries, reading old literature and trying to make some sort of conclusion about what populations must have been like. Uh, I can't tell you much more than that. So. Well, well, no worries. Thank you so much again. It was a great talk. Sure, thank you. All right, we've got, we'll take um, two more questions and then we'll open it up for more informal chat and, and anyone else who has questions, we can continue in that. Great, well, I, I see several names that I recognize. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, okay, so next question though is from Jessica Metter and you should be asked to unmute. Hi. Um, hi, Jessica. Hi. It was a really great talk. Um, you going on the tangent about cicadas. I'm a DC area native, so uh -huh. hit a little bit too close to home. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but I had a few, I had a couple of different questions. One I might save for the more informal one. Um, I know a big issue in the Caribbean right now is coming from stony coral disease. Um, right. And I'm wondering if you're starting to see an impact of stony coral disease on sponge growth rates and how that's impacting the feedback cycles 
if you're well we we'd, we'd love to study that in fact i have an nsf proposal in uh to try to uh quantify sponge populations in the caribbean now that i hope will be funded um, but uh, i have to tell you stony coral disease is is pretty much the death knell for reef building corals in the caribbean if you would like to see what I'm talking about, you can go to my YouTube channel. I have two uh, recent uh, YouTube recordings, one from the Turks and Caicos and one from Roatan. Both of those are relatively, or were in the past, relatively high coral cover uh, locations. And uh, stony coral disease has dev skittle D as we call it. Skittle D has completely wiped out uh, the remaining coral cover in those places. And I know that sounds like hyperbole, but it's true. And uh, it is, when I <laughs> dove in the Turks and Caicos in January of, 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 of 2020, so just a little more than a year ago, I could not believe what I was seeing because it was freshly dead within the last six months and it was nearly 100% loss. And, um, and this is reefs beginning at about 10 meters and going right down to 100 feet or lower or below because mm -hmm. the water quality there is really clear. You can see down to 200 feet and everything was dead or dying. So um, yeah, yeah. I'm, I've done a fair amount of diving in the Caribbean, especially in the Caymans where I know it's uh, becoming a big issue. So that's why I wanted to ask. I was yeah. also curious if you saw variations in sponge cover as depth, especially when you look at someplace like the Cayman where you're doing a pure wall diving. Yeah, I, I think that the sponges take a while to respond to the availability of new real estate. Uh, and it's, it's just a matter of time before they, uh, in competition with the macroalgae, which of course are there first, uh, start to take over some of that skeleton and cover it. Um, uh, a lot of that is new, newly freed up space, so it'll probably take um, years before you really see a strong effect. But you know, our, our studies in the Florida Keys, which was which have been decimated decades ago, already show that giant barrel sponges are increasing at a at a remarkable rate, a um, hundred and twenty percent increase over um, something like ten years uh, for some of our our surveys. Um, so the sponges clearly are taking advantage of the real estate. And, and that's why we think there's this, this circle between the macroalgae and the sponges. Uh, but, but again, Skittle D is pretty new. It just started in 2014. Uh, so the, the sponges response to it may be delayed somewhat. So, mm -hmm. and it's really only within the last two years that it's spread across the Caribbean and now it's pretty much everywhere. Thank you so much for answering that. I was just very curious. Sure. For the talk. All right, one last question before we open it up for everyone to oh, uh, turn on their cameras and unmute. Uh, so this one is from John Geller. In Never heard of him. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, John. <laughs> John, you're okay. There we go. Good to see you, Joe. Um, hey, I wanted to ask um, your thoughts about the, the really striking uh, morphological differences between the, you know, the Indo-Pacific uh, sponges and the Caribbean, where you have such striking, huge barrel-shaped and tubular uh, morphologies versus the folios and encrusting morphologies in the, in the Pacific. So if we, if we went back for 500, so, um, the, <clears throat> what do you think Caribbean would look like in, in terms of morphology? Would, would all those barrels and, and tubes have been pushed down into the matrix of the, of the coral reef and, and now they're living as crust? Um, or would they have just been rare? <laughs> and, and, and um, conversely, in the Pacific, um, would all those crusts start growing as barrels if we protected them from um, from turtles and and spongivorous fishes? 
Yeah, so um, great question because it's it, it, it strikes at this, what I think is a huge difference between the Caribbean and the Indo-Pacific, and that is the presence of folios phototrophic phylum sponges, plant sponges in the Indo-Pacific, but you will not find one species of phylo sponge in the Caribbean. Why should this be? And the reason I think is that even in pre-Columbian times, the difference between the Caribbean and in the Indo-Pacific is that you have these huge rivers emptying into the Caribbean, the Mississippi, the Magdalena, uh, the Orinoco, and during half of the year, the Amazon is directed up into the Caribbean by the prevailing winds. Now, all of that fresh water is full of dissolved organic carbon, mostly refractory forms of dissolved organic carbon, like tannins, which is how physical oceanographers identify the lens of water over the Caribbean. And that's distinctly different than anywhere else in the tropics, okay? And so what I think is that the sponge fauna of the Caribbean evolved in a nutritionally different environment where there was this source of food present that allowed the sponges in the Caribbean to take advantage of a form of dissolved organic carbon that was not present anywhere else. And the Caribbean has been like this for many, many millions of years. Okay, so you never got phyllo sponges. They never needed to evolve because there was always enough food. There was top-down predation that forced them into the interstices, but as long as they were protected from predators, they had all the water around them filled with food. So they could grow as far as they could and, and, and essentially were prevented from growing out into the, the open part of the reef by the constant grazing, grazing activity of turtles and spongivorous fishes, okay? On Indo-Pacific reefs, no such dissolved organic carbon source exists. So you have the evolution of phyllo sponges that rely on their microbial symbionts, essentially blue-green bacteria that grow in their tissue that they somehow extract uh, all of their nutrition from. So, so that's what I think is the difference between uh, the trajectory of the evolution of sponges in the Caribbean versus what's going on in the Indo-Pacific. And, and to the second part of your question, if you go to places in the Indo-Pacific where there's a lot of fresh water coming into the environment, like parts of the uh, uh, Indonesia, where there are these huge amounts of runoff from the islands, you do start seeing sponge communities that are similar to what you see in the Caribbean. So the pictures that I've seen of Wakatobi, uh, places where there's a lot of river input, you see more barrel sponges, more larger sponges on the reef than you see in places like the out islands of the Great Barrier Reef or any of the Oceania islands, Micronesia, Melanesia, all of these islands. You are hard pressed to even find a sponge on the reef. You really have to look. And when you find them, they are almost always one of several species within many genera of phyllo sponges, always with these tight associations with symbi symbiotic mutualistic uh, cyanobacteria. Do you buy that? <laughs> um, to some degree, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I guess you, you need to go to the Indian Ocean, I guess, where, uh, go to more of a continental um, setting that's still taxonomically distinct from the Caribbean. See yeah. If it works. Yeah. Anyway, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Sounds like West Africa is the next place to go to look at coral reefs on the other side of the Atlantic. Yeah, the, the Germans have been working in Tanzania and, and they, they claim that the fauna is more, um, there, there are more sponges. Uh, there's also more runoff. Um, there, there's this constant issue that people always think that pollution supports sponges, something that I don't agree with uh, for various reasons, but um, because it, they, they actually don't do well when it's nutrient runoff and there's a lot of, you know, fecal coliforms or whatever, they, 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 they seem to be more adapted for kinds of dissolved organic carbon that are, are not related to, to anthropogenic sources. So. But, but yeah, I mean, it's, this is definitely a, 
a, a hypothesis that can be tested. Um, and, you know, yes. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Uh, at this point, everybody should.